right, so we're picking up where we left off with different types of transport in the cell. So what we've already talked about, going back uh, really quick, is simple diffusion, which is the movement of substances from high concentrations to low concentrations, and that's just through the phospholipid bilayer. And that's kind of limited to, if you recall, um, small hydrophobic things. The molecules that are small and hydrophobic can pass through that bilayer, but uh, molecules that are hydrophilic, molecules that are ionic, polar, large, are not going to be able to go through that, that bilayer. And then osmosis was a special name for the diffusion of water. Even though a lot of the diffusion of water is happening through aquaporins, which are proteins, we're still going to associate the movement of water from high to low with osmosis, that special word. All right, so picking up from there, how do molecules get in the cell from high to low if they can't pass through the lipid bilayer? And the answer is what's called facilitated diffusion. So facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport is when membrane proteins carry specific molecules in or out of the cell. Again, this is from high to low. Be very, very careful that you don't make a mistake on the test and think facilitated transport requires energy. It does not. It is still moving things from high to low, but instead of them going through the phospholipid bilayer, they are going through protein channels or protein carriers, some kind of protein in the membrane. So some examples of this. I included aquaporins. They are technically proteins, but you would not typically say that water moves by facilitated transport. You would usually say osmosis. Um, ion channels are a good example. And there's also some that are called gated channels, and I'll show you a picture in a second, and also carrier proteins that undergo a shape change. Now, bottom line, if it says high to low through a protein, that's going to be facilitated diffusion. But you could also be asked to identify it from a picture. So how are you going to know it's facilitated diffusion from a picture? Here are a couple of pictures. Notice high concentration here, low concentration here through a protein, that would be facilitated. Again, high concentration here, lower concentration here. This is what's called a carrier, so the protein changes shape, but this would still be facilitated diffusion. If it just showed it going through the membrane directly, like this, that would be simple diffusion. And if it was going the other way, from low to high, that would be actually what's called active transport, which we're going to talk about in a minute. This is what's called a gated channel. Gated channels, they're, they're normally closed. You still have a high concentration here, but the gates are closed. Sort of like everybody's waiting to get into a concert, right? And everybody's bouncing around, and but the gates are closed. And when those gates open, this would come pouring through. This is actually a really important part of uh, how your nervous system works, is you have these gated channels that open when your nerves get stimulated, and they let sodium ions through. So, all of that fall under, fell under the category of passive transport. Passive meaning no cell energy is required. Active transport is anything that requires energy from the cell. And that's usually going to be in the form of ATP. If you see ATP in the picture, it's active transport. So this includes what are called pumps. A pump is a protein that moves molecules against the gradient. So remember the picture that I just showed you a facilitated transport going high to low through a protein. If it's going low to high through a protein, this would be a pump, which would be active transport. It would require energy. And I give the example a lot of times is if you were sitting in a boat and all of a sudden your boat got a hole in it, water would be coming into your boat by passive transport. It would be going from high concentrations outside to lower concentrations inside. But if you didn't want to sink, you would have a bucket, a little bucket, and you would be doing active transport. You would be grabbing water from inside your boat and trying to pump it against the gradient from where there's less water in your boat to where there's more water outside to try to prevent yourself from sinking. So active transport includes pumps that push things the opposite direction of their natural flow. And it also includes what's called bulk transport, which we're going to talk about last. Um, which is when a cell surrounds and engulfs something, like this. That's going to require energy for a different reason, not necessarily because you're going high to low, but because it actually does require energy for the cell to move and engulf, to move pseudopods, like your macrophages, eating bacteria, things like that. That's going to require ATP also for the cell to move. 
All right, this is a little diagram showing an animation of active transport. And technically, it looks like the molecules are going from high to low concentration. So that's not really what I want you to see in this picture. What I actually want you to see in this picture is how ATP is involved, um, because we're going to talk about this in just a second. So notice you start with ATP, and boom, it becomes ADP, and a phosphate breaks off. So just a really quick ATP, the T is for triphosphate. And what happens when ATP binds to a carrier protein that's part of active transport is that a phosphate, the phosphate breaks off and attaches to it. And now this is ADP for dye. So a lot of times you learn freshman bio that ATP provides energy. You know, it's our energy currency, blah, blah, blah. How does it actually do that? So one of the ways ATP provides energy is that when the phosphate breaks off, specifically in membrane proteins, is it can initiate a shape change in the protein. So you'll notice that when the phosphate attaches here, this protein changes its shape so that this molecule can come through. And then when the phosphate breaks off, the protein goes back to its original shape again. So let me uh, initiate this again. ATP comes in, phosphate breaks off and sticks, protein changes shape. Phosphate breaks off, ATP comes in, phosphate breaks off, etc. Um, and that means that, um, that if your cell, remember your mitochondria are kind of your main generator of ATP, eventually if you don't have mitochondria, you would run out of ATP. Your cells would die. So the, the ATP um, that's being made, what's really happening in your mitochondria is it's putting this back together again. It's sticking that phosphate back on so that ATP is available constantly for different cell reactions, one of which is this, active transport. So the most common example of active transport, sort of the textbook example, although it's not the only one, um, is what's called the sodium potassium pump. So I'm going to show you the steps of what happens in the sodium potassium pump. And again, you're going to see ATP is involved here. So the first thing that happens, this is a membrane protein. Notice that you already have a high concentration of sodium outside the cell. So this pump is going to pump sodiums out to where there's already a high concentration. It's going from low to high. So right there, that's a clue that this is going to be a pump. So the first thing that happens is that the, the shape of this protein is attracted uh, to sodium. So sodium ions are floating around, and when they happen to bind here, they'll stick. When three sodiums are hooked to this protein, the protein binds to ATP, and ATP drops off a phosphate. P with a circle around it is like a shorthand way of writing phosphate. Um, so the phosphate binds here, and here's what's going to happen. When the phosphate binds, remember what I told you on the previous slide, it's going to initiate this protein to change its shape. So boom. Now notice the protein swaps shape because of the phosphate. And that new shape is not attracted to sodium anymore. So these sodium ions are dropped off on the outside. So three sodium ions have now been pumped out of the cell. The new shape is attracted to potassium, but not three, only two. So two potassiums will now bind. And when they bind, that actually changes the shape of the protein slightly so that this phosphate's not attracted anymore, and this phosphate breaks off and leaves. And when the phosphate leaves, the pro protein is basically going to snap back into its original shape again. Boom. It's now back to its original shape. And remember, its original shape is not attracted to potassium. So these potassiums are going to get dropped off. So summarizing, three sodiums basically get pumped out against the concentration gradient. Two potassiums get pumped in against their concentration gradient. And it requires one ATP in order to initiate this. Technically, it's the phosphate from ATP that does this. Here's a little animation of it. Oh, I take that back. Here's a summary of diffusion, facilitated diffusion. These are all passive, high to low. And then active transport, low to high. The clues, you're going low to high. And the fact that you see ATP is a huge clue that it's active transport. So this is an animation. So notice what happens. It's not really like the sodiums are waiting in line, but here's three sodiums. When they bind, ATP drops off a of phosphate. They're not showing the ATP, but the phosphate's there. That causes the shape change. The three sodiums leave. Now, potassium combined. Again, they're not waiting in line like it looks like here. That causes the phosphate to break off, which then causes the protein to change back to its original shape. So that is your sodium-potassium pump in a nutshell. Again, I'll show you. Let it run one more time. Three sodiums bind. That causes ATP to drop off a of phosphate. 
The phosphate causes the protein's shape to change, so it's no longer attracted to sodium, but now it's attracted to potassium instead. When two potassiums bind, it causes that phosphate to no longer be attracted, and it breaks off, which then causes this protein to go back to its original shape, and the phosphates are, or the potassiums are brought in. Okay. The next thing is what's called an electrochemical gradient. So an electrochemical gradient, it's really just a vocabulary word that refers to when you have a difference in the number of ions and the charge on two sides of a, mem of a membrane. So the name electrochemical comes from electrical, that there's a difference in charge on two sides of a membrane, and chemical, because you have a difference in the number of actual chemicals or ions on the two sides of the membrane. And what happens in an electrochemical gradient, why is it important? It sets up a scenario for cells to do work. Um, it causes what's called membrane potential. And membrane potential is measured in volts. Membrane potential is a difference in voltage on two sides of a membrane. And it turns out, for example, in your nerve cells, because of the sodium-potassium pump, remember how three sodiums are going out, but only two potassiums are coming in? And that, in relation with some other things that are going on, basically make the inside of your cell negative 70 millivolts compared to the outside. It's 70 millivolts more negative. That's the membrane potential. And that sets up a scenario, like I said, for nerve impulses. When a nerve gets stimulated, what happens is sodium channels open, gated channels. And remember what happens? The sodiums are sort of waiting at the gate, like they're waiting to get into a concert. You have all these sodiums that have built up out here, and they just come flooding in here and it causes the inside to temporarily become positive, and that initiates a nerve impulse. Uh, so that's uh, membrane potential. And pumps that generate voltage are, are, are called ion pumps because they're pumping ions. The best example in eukaryotic cells would be your sodium potassium pump, but another example of an ion pump is also what's called a proton pump. It's called a proton pump because hydrogen only has one proton and one electron. And if the electron leaves, then hydrogen is nothing but a proton. So that, that's why they're called proton pumps. Proton pumps are really important in plants, fungi, bacteria, mitochondria, and I didn't list it here, but even chloroplasts. In your mitochondria, what happens is your mitochondria has a double membrane, and this proton pump pumps hydrogen ions or protons into this intermembrane space. And this actually sets up a gradient that ends up ultimately generating a bunch of ATP for you. Most of your ATP are made in, by this specific process. So the building up of ions on one side of a membrane sets up what's, what's, what's basically an energy gradient. Uh, and so this can be really important. So why would you want to set up this energy gradient? Here's one really good example. Oh, well, here's a picture of a proton pump. So notice it's going low to high. And notice ATP is involved. So this is called co-transport. And this happens in your cells too. I know glucose is brought into certain cells using co-transport with sodium ions. So notice what happens here. The proton pump pumps hydrogens into this space out here. This plant cell needs sucrose. But sucrose can only go into the cell if it travels along with hydrogen. I kind of think it's a lot like when you go to a carnival and there's a ride that has no single riders. So sucrose would be like a single rider. It has to wait for hydrogen to get on the ride with it in order to go through. So does this sucrose transporter require ATP? No, not directly. But if this shut down, if there was no more ATP and this proton pump stopped pumping hydrogens here, then the sucrose wouldn't be able to get in either because it would run out of hydrogens, which is the rider that rides along with the hydrogens to get into the cell. So that's kind of interesting. Or let's say you increase the amount of ATP, then you would have more hydrogens, the cell could bring in even more sucrose. So co-transport is where active transport of one thing is important in driving, bringing something else in. Sucrose may be moving from high to low. This may not require energy directly, but because it requires hydrogen, and in some cases our cells do this with sodium, sodium uh, is linked to bringing in glucose, so if, if your sodium pumps shut down, then you wouldn't be able to bring glucose into your cells either. So they're indirectly related. So that's co-transport. The last one we're going to talk about is bulk transport. And this is another form of active transport. And I'm going to tell you about this one in the next lecture.